Hello, hello, hello. So I am going, as, as I'm doing this, I'm asking Ara, what the? <laughs> there was supposed to be some notes, so yeah. I make sure I say all the things that I need to say. There we go. Yeah, uh, that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> there we go. Actually. Yay. Yay. And Spectacular. Um, so, so, move forward. Yeah, there we go. And then, okay. that one. Nope, awesome. not that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So now you see who really runs things. <laughs> right here. Yeah. <Okay. laughs> Thank you so much. All right. So I am delighted to have you here today. Um, you probably already heard a little bit about the housekeeping. Um, no. So let's go back a slide. Um, so. Just wanting to make sure that you take a moment to all silence your phones. And if you're joining us on Zoom, hello out there. Um, please also take uh, your, your video off and mute your mic, right? So we can focus on the presentations that are coming today from the interns. Um, housekeeping, you don't have a badge outside. The pronoun stickers there too. There are also um, bath bathrooms straight out the door right here. Um, there's also a gender neutral bathroom on the fourth floor if that's preferable it's on both sides of 440 the lecture hall and there's a water station on the other side of this space but unfortunately we're trying to you know have to we ask that you walk around because this is a you'll learn a, a very special section and we want to make sure that no one goes through that door right now okay so housekeeping aside here we are at our sixth summer internship program. Thank you all for joining us. Um, today you're gonna to be treated to three presentations from our groups. These are teams that have worked intensely over nine weeks to deliver a prototype of a research-based video game. And they've designed it to the specifications of their client, each team having a different client. So I wanted to start with a little bit about the internship itself. The applications for this year's internship program were really quite competitive. It's been getting more so every year. We're getting more and more people who are really focused on games, and that's awesome. Our internship is, of course, paid, and it involves working collaboratively in teams supported by a coach. Our coaches, who you'll, I'll introduce you to in, in a few moments, um, meet both with the team and each intern one-on-one, -on -one, and they provide support throughout the nine-week program. As the teams work together to produce their games, they were also refining hard skills like Unity, like um, or, or Unreal Engine, right? So the, the so, so the programming engines that we use for game development, uh, project management, design, and presentation skills, but also soft skills like communication, collaboration, negotiation. Working in teams can be challenging, as all of you who work in teams know. So each team has several roles. We have a project coordinator, we have an artist, we have a designer, and we have a programmer. And depending on the needs of that particular project, we might have a couple, uh, two people in, in each role. But importantly, at the end of the internship, all of our interns have added a game that they have contributed significantly to, to their portfolio of work to share with future employers. Our program is funded by the National Science Foundation and has been since 2019. We have this site here, which, which started two years ago, and our sister program at UC San Diego, which started in 2019. Just a moment about neurodiversity. Neurodiversity at work has become a really hot topic in part because it's clear that standard workforce recruitment management and retention pathways really tend to exclude the neurodivergent talent that is, is here in this room today. And it leads to significantly lower employment rates among neurodivergent people and particularly among college educated people, which is perhaps surprising. There are some efforts to address this in the community at large, although most of those efforts have focused on computing and tech. And specifically, there's been a real focus on quality assurance analysis. But I don't know how many of you are QA analysts in this room. Anybody? Anybody? It's not exactly a job for everyone. Just as folks in this room have a lot of creative talents and interests that they're bringing to their job, so too do the neurodiverse folks in this room. They want to bring their wide range of talents interests, skills that are highly valued in the workplace and particularly in game design and development. 
You're about to hear from our colleague, Pierre Esketch. Pierre, apologies, um, I'm not French. <laughs> Pierre is a games industry veteran leading nothing short of a revolution at the AAA game company Ubisoft, where he is leading his team to develop new recruitment, management, and retention pathways to increase the chances of engaging and retaining valuable neurodivergent talent in the games industry. And I'm now going to ask Pierre to tell you more. Yes, thank you very much, Leanne. Can you hear me well? And thank you, Pierre. We'd like to see you though, too. Yeah, and I'm going to try to my camera if I can't activate it. Sorry, folks. That's okay. I'm dealing yeah. with Zoom here. I need to activate my camera. We did. Uh, and has been supporting our internship for the past three years with increasing um, engagement every year. We are, we are thrilled to have it. We'll, we'll talk about all the people who have been part of that at the end and our thank yous. Yeah? This time it should work. I don't know if you can see me. Yes. Okay. Yeah, awesome. So thank you very much, Leanne, for, for this introduction. Uh, you, you did pronounce my name, family name, almost very well. It's Pierre Esquesh. So. I'm very pleased, first of all, to be with you all today uh, in the name of Ubisoft. And, and I have to say that we are extremely happy uh, to have the opportunity to bring our support to this amazing program. This is the third year in a row. And uh, we're going to, to discuss a little bit more about that, right? So my name is, is indeed is uh, Pierre Esquesh. I'm uh, 51. I've been working in the video game industry for the last 25 years, always in the same company, Ubisoft. I have a manager profile. And uh, I'm uh, also an adhd -er, father of uh, ADHD kids and dyslexic kids. My wife is dyspraxic and we're living in a happy neurodivergent family. Um, and at Ubisoft today, uh, um, I have a, a very specific job, which is for the moment not very common. I'm a neurodiversity talent program director for Ubisoft. So I would like to, to tell you a little bit more about that and about why neurodiversity is important for Ubisoft. Well, first of all, it's a fact there is a, an intimate link between neurodiversity and video game. And to illustrate that, first of all, I would like to quote a study and a census made uh, in UK last year among the uh, British video game developer, which is saying and reporting that more than 18% of the British video game developers self-identify as neurodivergent. It means it is more than in the general population. And more specifically, we have two conditions which are overrepresented versus the general population. First, the ADHD with 10% versus five in the general population. And people on the spectrum with 4% versus a little bit less than two in the general population. Um, at Ubisoft level, we don't have precise uh, number, but uh, about two years ago, we did create an employee resource group on neurodiversity. Um, and when I met Leanne two years ago, we, we just created that group, we were just 50 people. Today, we are 460 members. Half of them are ADHD and more than 100 self-identify on the spectrum. So, Yes, we, we, we are meeting those criteria. We do believe that about 18 to 20% of our workforce is neurodivergent. Some of us, we know it. Some other don't know it yet. And the other thing also is that that link between the video game industry and neurodiversity, you know, this shouldn't come as a surprise because think a little bit about who did create the video game industry. 40 years ago, geeks, nerds, techies. <laughs> it's us, we did create the industry. Um, and it's logical because when you know the strength and the talent 
of neurodivergent minds, it fits exactly with the type of skill we need to develop great game. So what is our objective? Well, it's the same as yours during those uh, eight, nine weeks uh, internship. It's to try to make the best game ever. And to do this, we need to always be creative and always innovate. You know, if I refer to one of the very first video game, Pong, back in 1972, I was born in 1972. Well, it, it was the, 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 the craft of, of an individual or a couple of individuals. You know, at that time, creating a game was like playing football two versus two on a small, tiny field. But technology evolved and creating game today is just like playing football on a field that is increases its size every 10 minutes. We're adding new player, new job, new skills constantly. And today, AAA games may gather more than 1,000 developer, three to five years development time, budget over 100 million US dollar. So they are big beasts. So we want to make the best game ever. And for this, we need to be always creative and innovative. So what did we learn at Ubisoft over the last 40 years? Well, we learned that to do the best game, we need to gather around the table as many different brains as possible. To design and deliver the best game, we need to have people who have different ways to look at the world, to see the world, different ways to solve problems, different ways to think, to work. And that's essential. And we need to be able to put all those people whether there are neurodi neurodivergent or neurotypical working together. I would like to make you a, a, a quote an analogy here to illustrate this. You know, to make a video game today, it's just like in Star Wars, you have two options. You may be the empire and decide to create an army of clones. Or you may decide to join the rebellion. Who is winning at the end? It's not the clones. <laughs> It's a rebellion. And the rebellion, what is that? It's our ability to gather a band of people who are very different, but they match together and they find a way to collaborate. So as Ubisoft and as a video game developer, today we're facing three main challenges. The first one is that we know we have a lot of neurodivergent thinker in the organization but we're not sure we are doing our best to leverage all their talents so we need to get better there second we need to continuously learn how to work together because the natural trend of a business is to try to create an army of clones so we need to learn how we can create a band of rebel and the last challenge is that we know that in the next 10 years, there won't be enough resources trained on the market for our needs. So we need to act actively look for talents elsewhere. And that is why we decided to create a dedicated neurodiversity talent program. Our first mission right now is that we are focusing on training our HR, recruiter, manager, and peers about neuroinclusion. We raise awareness on what is neurodiversity, what is neurodivergences, what it means. We try to explain how the brain is working, that the talent of each of every individual, they are coming uh, with uh, um, needs, requirements, work environment specificities. Second, uh, we are working on improving our ways to include different thinker, different brain. Because today we have some great individual, great managers, some great HR who are able to collaborate, integrate and work uh, with neuroatypical folks as well as neurotypical. But it's a knowledge in the end of a few individuals. So now what we try to do is to expand that knowledge to the entire company. And ultimately what we want to do is that we want to continue to recruit neurodivergent folks in the future. 
uh, and more if possible. So again, I'm going to stop there, but I would like, um, I know you're going to uh, showcase your work. It's an important moment. So I want to congratulate each of you for your involvement over the last nine weeks. Um, I'm really going to see the result and I really hope uh, that you will have the opportunity to join our industry and why not be soft. It's sure that our industry has still some work to do to be more inclusive, but I can tell you that at Ubisoft level, we're trying to do our part. And the secret recipe uh, to develop the best games is to be able to be more inclusive. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Pierre. That was inspiring. And I hope that you all realize that what we're doing here today is really trying to bring this crucible of talent forward so that we can bring forth that future that uh, that Pierre so clearly <laughs> stated. Thanks, Pierre. Okay, so now to, uh, well, are there any questions, I guess? Have any questions of Pierre while he's here? I mean, he'll, he'll stay and listen, but uh, most likely. But it is late for him. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. Okay, so I just want to make a moment to introduce our coaches. I'm going to ask you to all stand up. Ori Seitz and Yijun Shirley Chen and Shravan Dinakaran. <laughs> all these folks are graduate students and members of our lab. And based on what I told you about what they do, you will uh, hopefully appreciate the management training that these folks had over the past nine weeks. It's been fantastic. Um, and they have been wonderful guides for our teams. Um, that little, that cool little logo in the corner is the symbol for our lab, Rehabilitation Games um, XR. And Shirley, being the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial uh, PhD student that she is, has placed um, a study. We don't just make games during the summer, we make games for research purposes. And there's a study you might want to check out that's out there <laughs> or and over there. <laughs> just, just so you know. Okay, so now what you've been waiting for um, are the projects. And I think Ori is going to go first, and each of the coaches are going to introduce their team. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Hi, everyone. My name is Yuri Seitz, and I've had the privilege of coaching for our morning team. Over the course of the summer, I've gotten to witness how they have all grown not only in their individual roles, but as a team and built upon our repository of knowledge of Unreal Engine which they have done a phenomenal job of trailblazing over the course of this internship. And without further ado, I would like to welcome up the team. Aiko. The team guy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, hello. Um, I um, welcome to our presentation uh, for. Let me check the mic. There we go. That's good. Uh, welcome to our presentation for the game Ice Cream Piers. So, uh, at the beginning of this internship, we were given a uh, the task of creating a game that uses an augmentative alternative communication device. These are, as you can see in the visual, any sort of software that is used to provide um, a visual language for people who are struggling with, not, uh, with verbal language. Uh, they are a very useful tool to help with uh, people's communications in that regard. Uh, however, there were basically no examples of it ever being used as a controller for a video game. So that was our task. We wanted to uh, create a game that would use one of uh, this software as a controller. Uh, not only that, we also wanted to make this game multiplayer so that people who communicate in this way, uh, their com uh, communication methods and collaboration skills could be researched. Uh, we wanted to make something that was fun and enjoyable and could encourage further use of this, um, of this game 
uh, and more importantly, the AAC device. Uh, as we were targeting a age range of around seven to 10 years old and communication skills probably at even a younger age. So our main goal was to just make positive uh, memories attached to this device so that people will continue to feel encouraged to use in the future. Uh, and while we made one game for this, we also made sure the engine for our game is easily reusable for multiple games so that this sort of uh, control style for games can continue to be used. Uh, that being said, our, our idea that we came up with for the game is a game called Ice Cream Tears. So uh, that was our trailer. Our game is about you and a partner taking the role of these ice cream uh, making uh, robots that run an ice cream parlor uh, for the friendly customers that come and visit. Um, customers will order and will make an order for ice cream. And this order will be made up of two scoops of ice cream, both of which can have a different flavor, as well as an amount of whipped cream. The player will receive tips as a scoring mechanic for how accurate they get the ice cream when they finally serve it to the customer. And our main target with this game was to create a game that felt that encouraged players to make the ice cream however they saw fit, uh, allow them to basically reenact a real world skill to show that they can do these real world skills uh, as part of our encouragement piece. Um, more about the mechanics of the game, uh, the AAC device that we use is how most of the ice cream changes are made. Um, the ice cream, the colors, which would be the flavors, uh, as well as um, commands like making sure whether you're choosing the top scoop or bomb scoop, whether you want to have more or less topping, and when you're finally done with your ice cream to serve it, uh, will all be attached using something called Seaboard, which is one of these AAC devices, which you can see a picture of in the slide. Um, players will uh, tap the symbols on the Seaboard and then submit they uh, submit that as a command, and that will allow them to make changes in the game. Along with an AAC device, the players also have access to a mouse, which is used to uh, move the camera around, as well as clicking any UI elements. And yeah, so that's an overview of our game. Now getting on to the specific roles each of our uh, team members possess. I'll start with me. Uh, I am the designer on this project. Uh, that means I was the one who initially uh, came up with the idea to turn the client's request into an ice cream game, uh, as well as that I also managed the uh, the design documents, all the notes we took, uh, initial ideas, uh, and making sure that was all formatted into our final um, final game uh, and in managing documents that would serve as references for the rest of the team. Uh, I took on the task of level design. So I, I was the designer for that ice cream parlor. I both uh, set up the initial layout in, on in concept art, as well as also designing the actual 3D level in Unreal. And uh, when about halfway through the internship, I sort of uh, a design role was less needed. I switched over to doing an art role, specifically working on uh, 2D art. I started with all of our concept art for uh, character designs, uh, level layout, as said before, UI design. I continued to make digital versions of that UI design and was the one who put all of that into Unreal. 
And finally, when uh, towards the end of the project, I switched to doing all the promotional art, including our cover artwork, our itch page, our uh, trailer that you saw before. Um, I've learned a lot of valuable skills uh, and have uh, gotten uh, to learn a lot of like the the helpful of helpfulness of having versatility uh, in the workplace. Uh, so that's my thing. Uh, passing it off to more specifics about art, uh, I'm going to pass this off to our artist Molly. Hi, I'm Molly. I am the artist for our team. Most of my involvement was more on the 3D side of things, while Ico did more 2D art. But part of that, um, working with Ico, I took her concepts and translated those to 3D. And as you can see on the examples, um, these are more of the 3D models that you'll see in the game, such as the whole interior layout, the bell, the ice cream cones, and all other kind of props and decorations. When I was doing this in mind, I had to make sure we were using in kind of an accessible, friendly color scheme since um, our target audience for kids are younger and they might have sensitivities to color. So we had to use a lighter pastel color palette to make sure it wouldn't be overwhelming for them. And more of the interior props, we were going for more of an old whoops, ice cream parlor aesthetic. So you can kind of see there too, we have the fridge, the booths. We were just kind of keeping it to a rounded aesthetic just to keep it simple so it wouldn't be confusing for the kids as well. And the second half of what I did was I worked on the customer models and the player model. Uh, we wanted to use animals because, you know, kids, they love animals all the time. So we have a cast of six animals, different ones, and we themed them, a few of them around therapy animals, just as coming up with the accessibility thing too, because these kids might also have therapy animals, as you know, maybe a guinea pig or a rabbit, or we have maybe even like chickens. Some people have all kinds of therapy animals as well. And they also did the design for the player model. We kind of ended up calling it toaster bot since it's kind of got that boxy shape to its body. And we just wanted to keep it simple as well so it wouldn't like scare the kids. So we just have, following with the theme too, we just have their joint list. So it would just kind of follow this very simple aesthetic since we just wanted to keep everything very simple since that was what is in mind for our target audience in doing that. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jack. Hello, I am Jack Navarrete. I'm one of the programmers, and I worked on the Pure Play uh, plugin concept, which was a way to connect the AEC board to Unreal Engine with some quality of life. Uh, so this is how it works. We have people, uh, we have the players plugging in their C boards into the game, and then we we have the uh, Python script uh, take from the uh, take some. Uh, the button information from the C board and then uh, taking it and uploading it to a web server API uh, that works more like a dedicated server. And then this will collect the button information and send it to a database, a uh, MySQL database. Um, and then this MySQL database will be pulled into the API again for that information to get sent to the uh, Unreal Engine C++, which is uh, querying the API. Uh, and then the C++ uh, sends it to an HTT communicator blueprint in Unreal Engine. So what I learned from uh, making this uh, plugin was that uh, Unreal Engine does not actually have support for SQL databases because there is no such thing as SQL queries anymore in uh, Unreal Engine 5. Um, the, uh, that's, uh, the reason why we have my SQL database, um, uh, API connected to it. Um, the, uh, the C++ and blueprint, um, was a bit interesting because, uh, 
they're two very different languages. Blueprints are a visual scripting language, and C++ is just a uh, more of your rudimentary language, like Python. Um, it's a uh, C++ was a bit of a challenge because it's not like actual C++. It's more on the side of uh, Unreal Engine, which Unreal Engine has its own gameplay framework. So that was kind of hard to work in, but I figured it out and it, we can make our own blueprints now using just C++ and then using those blueprints in the visual scripting. So yeah, now I'm gonna hand it off to uh, our per, my fellow programmer, Carl. Thank you, Jack. Hi, I'm Carl Kaw, and I'm privileged to be the programmer responsible for bringing our idea to life. Three fun facts here. One, this is my first time developing a video game. Two, this is my first time with Unreal Engine. And three, this is my first time in Boston. You know what else the number three is good for, though? Anybody want to answer that question? OK, let's just say you theoretically answered my question. That's right, a countdown. Now, everyone, please help me count down as I present the evolution of peer play from day one to today. So ready? Three, two, one. Thank you. The best part, I learned so much. I learned that doing Unreal was essentially being like in the first stage of dating. You know how you first get to Unreal in the surface, no Unreal on the surface, runtime editor and layout tools, viewport for assembling in-game assets, material editor for coloring and texturing our 3D models in the game, blueprints for logic, player input, and coding the actual game, UMG use for user interface design, and timelines for animation. All of that effort only to be met with a compile error message. <laughs> Man. Though, I did learn a lot of stuff. While working on peer play, I realized that chaos isn't always a bad thing. It pushed me to learn new stuff and solve problems. So instead of reacting negatively, I would Google solutions or documentations in YouTube and then consult the angry developers and then figure it out from there. And you're also going to be figuring out when I'm finishing. So with that, I'm inviting James, project coordinator, to the podium. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm James. I'm the project coordinator. Before I get into what directly I did for this project, I'm going to talk about the important skills I learned over the time of this project, because I think that's also important as well as going over what I did. The, mo the main skill I really like improved upon is communication because before I actually gotten into this project, I always had problems like communicating with other people, but my role made it so I can communicate more clearer and think about what I'm about to say before I actually say something in formatting emails to our client is like all important stuff I actually improved upon during this internship. Another thing I like to talk about that I really learned it throughout this internship is the time management skill, which I had really bad problems with organization and like just creating like deadlines for a specific task get that done before I actually started working on this internship. So I think it's important that I actually learned how to manage my time correctly so I can actually do better at many tasks in the future. But I'm going to talk about what I exactly did during this internship. But like my main importance of this role is to make sure that the 
I can communicate with the client so she understands what what we're creating and what we're planning on putting in so we can actually talk to her about all of the important stuff we want to put in and then we can go over like what's the most important stuff to put in like what's the expectations of the game when it over the next in the next meeting and another thing i like to talk about is the importance of exit tickets uh, exit tickets isn't okay and the exit tickets are the most important thing one of the most important things because it really tells every single person in my peers like it tells my peers what they what each thing needs to be done to accomplish the next goal in the game like without exit tickets the game wouldn't be nearly made if you know what i mean yeah exit tickets are just always the most one of the most important things to put out inside the game because it just organizes everything and it completely makes sure that each each important part of the game is done well and not rushed and actually is functional all right before before we exit before this presentation ends i would like to quickly thank everyone for making this a surreal experience possible for all of us thank you yeah. So uh, we do have uh, some time for a, Q, a short Q&A session after. Uh, so uh, feel free to inquire, ask us anything we might know. Yeah, there will also be, yeah, uh, all of the games have been set up in the um, computers out uh, in the back of the room. So you'll get to see all the games in more depth. Uh, yes. Were there any skills you developed through the question is, uh, any surprising skills that you weren't expecting to have learned and uh, seem to have uh, found out about during the internship? Uh, I definitely didn't know I was ever going to have to connect a database the way I did to an AAC device. That was completely, I mean, I was, didn't even know I needed an API for it. So it was a very, very interesting thing I did and learned how to do. As somebody who's been designing, who's been delving in the fields of product design and front end development, it was really interesting for me to develop a new skill in this internship. That skill was algorithmic thinking because I just really never figured out, because like imagine, you're simply taking an order from a customer. In real life, it's just you saying, hi, I want an ice cream. And the server knows what to do. But in my case, it's actually, get. it's like you're picking into the brain of the customer that's really just a, an abstract 3D model, telling the customer to, okay, make sure you understand what the other thing is saying, and then make sure you respond accordingly. So in just like how our brains process it, it's like, oh, okay, that customer wants an ice cream. I'm going to make an association for that customer's face. And now the ice cream. What's an ice cream? Oh, sweet, round, solid, liquidy like things. Oh, red color. So you have to put in all of that into almost like a step-by-step -step instruction for the program to understand. So that's what I surprised me picked up. And I'm very thankful for it.
All righty. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and bring up the coach of Rhythm Power, Shirley, to go ahead and introduce the team. Like my team come with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love technical difficulties. Okay. Cool. Um, share is loading. Yeah. All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm their second year PhD students, also the coach for Rhythm Power Group. I really want to appreciate my amazing team uh, who works super hard, extremely hard for their, over their past eight weeks, eight to nine weeks to make this happen. And for most of them, it's the first time to develop a video game and they are able to manage all their technical struggles and challenges and to create this interesting and fun music rhythm game for older adults. So here I'm going to give the opportunity to my teammates here and that's each of them to introduce a little bit more about their project. Come on, Nick. I, I'm a little tall, so give me a second. <laughs> all right, is this good? Perfect. Hello, my name is uh, Nick Berbulis. I am one of the designers for Rhythm Power, and uh, this is Rhythm Power, a healthy exercise game that shall be discussed. Now, what exactly is Rhythm Power? Rhythm Power as a concept is an exer game, which is to say a game that incorporates exercise as a mechanic in order to help promote uh, health and fitness while also having fun. This game in particular was meant to be marketed to people of 65 years or older, though anyone can play a game like this. This was just what we wanted to keep in mind for potential limitations of ability and also a certain uh, aesthetic inspiration, shall, as shall be discussed. Now, the key thing about this game mechanically is it is taking the computer camera of your average PC or in a standard attached camera that you can put to a, a PC or a Windows type computer and allows you to actually project yourself into the game and follow through certain movements provided by the guide character Curly. Not this character, mind you. This is you. As you can see, I am you. And <laughs> The idea is to follow through the movements, which will help you gain score, which will then help you gain a high score at the end. Now, this is Curly. Curly is going to be the guide character in the game. And the important thing is Curly's movements and animations are almost all from the upper body and above. This is something that shall be discussed more by Abigail a little bit further down the road, but one of the early concepts we had was that things were supposed to be from the upper body and higher, so as to ensure research purposes. And we developed a varied song, <clears throat> a varied song selection for the purposes of entertainment, as well as working hard to create a game that'll serve certain uh, client uh, requests for research that shall also be discussed as we continue on. Now, without further ado, that's the introduction. If Gray would be so kind as to explain his role. I am not as tall as him. Um, <laughs> so my main focus was the uh, UI of the project um, and just basically making sure that it was functional, making sure all the buttons went to you know, the right scenes and um, also implementing a master volume that controls the volume of the entire game. So it would um, lower the volume for every song. Um, and I was also tasked to like make sure that everything fit onto the play screen and everything looked nice and uh, neat. And 
that's basically <laughs> it for the UI. So I'm gonna now pass it off to Megan. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Megan Gibson and I was the artist for our game. Uh, on our very first, uh, sorry, on our very first day, our team already had a solid idea of what our game was going to look like and how it was going to function, but we had no initial ideas of how it was going to look. So one of my very first jobs as the team artist was to decide the visual style for the project. Um, I uh, I put together four different concept boards inspired by different exercise fashions of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and today. Uh, something I found very rewarding was that the whole team decided on which style to go with, and we agreed a 60s inspired style would be fun and stand out from your typical rhythm game design. Um, I was heavily inspired by uh, 1960s variety show sets. Uh, the chair, chair exercise videos and mid-century exercise fashion. I wanted to keep a limited color palette uh, to give it a warm vintage feeling and to keep the visual language of our game consistent. I was also the one who made the decision to have the characters done in a two-dimensional style, which was a choice I made to keep production time down. Um, the limited colors and the puppet style characters uh, did come with their own set of issues because of that, but I feel like our team was able to face these challenges and come out even stronger. And I hope everyone here enjoys our game as much as I do. And next up, I would like to introduce Abby St. Amon to talk more about how we chose the music for our game. So, uh, hi, as Megan said, I am Abby St. Mond, and I am the second designer for this game, along with Nick. And I took a more interest in the technical aspect while Nick focused on the artistic. So I will be introducing you all to the music that we have selected for this game. So we currently have 12 songs that total in 25 minutes, which we have selected for use in our game. And we have chosen one song for the demo today that I feel like some of you will be familiar with. Um, all the music that we have selected is either something that is was in the Creative Commons or for whatever reason is public domain or free for us to use because we really didn't want too much of a difference between the version of the game that would be used in research as we were commissioned by a lab Use this, which is going to use this for research purposes, as well as the version that would end up on the going to the public. And the despite being very that we couldn't use a lot of like well known songs, we were able to find many songs that not only went with the era that we were going for, but fit into many different styles and rhythms. And we were very grateful for all the incredible resources that we had. Now, moving on to the dance moves, we have 22 dance moves finalized and animated. And this, these are what some of the movement icons would be on the little scroll bar that comes up on the side that I love the little illustrations that Megan has made. Um, and these moves are all inspired by different dances, workout routines, and yoga poses. I spent a lot of my time looking at the Golden Girls workout video <laughs> and different dancer size videos and was able to find a good amount of inspiration. Once again, as Nick explained, we are focused on upper body movement for both the safety of the player as well as from a technical programming standpoint, because the last thing we would want is someone to be dancing and falling over and hurting themselves. So it's really easier if the player is just sitting in a solid non-rolling chair, it greatly limits the risk of them falling down and hurting themselves, as well as it means that we only need to worry about animating the top half of the body. So it is great from a programming standpoint to not have to worry about animating the legs. And despite 
it being it being 3D movements that we are using, we were able to successfully manage to do it on a 2D plane. And to go into more of the tracking and how we were able to model and do such movements, I will hand it over to our other programmer, Patrick. Uh, hello, I'm Patrick. I'm the other programmer next to uh, Gray. So one of the, what we used to, tr <clears throat> sorry. Um, the way this game works, it accesses the camera in your computer or your laptop or your plug-in, whichever you're using to play the game. And it, we use a system called PoseNet. If you are not familiar with that, it's sort of like the app on your phone that scans your face and puts a funny filter on it or something. It's just more of a full body version of that. Um, it only works on the 2D axis, however, so we had we couldn't do anything fancy with like forward or backward movements, but side to side, that works great. Um, one of the downsides of using this, however, is that using multiple people at once it tends to glitch the camera out a little bit. You can see just by watching this, it is a little stiff to put it. Don't worry, we you will not have a rib cage. This well, is an will, early. <laughs> yeah, we'll put a skull in there too. <laughs> um, and trust me, it get it does glitch out a bit if there's more than one person, which if you look at our area, it is a bit taped off, and we'll have the screen next to it. Um, Um, on top of the pose net, something else I helped out on was the 2D animation. We tried using Blender originally, but um, that proved to be a little difficult because that re relies on 3D models, and we were trying to apply it to a 2D sprite and 2D images of curly and swirly. Um, so what I did, I found something's uh, package for Unity that specializes in editing uh, 2D models like 2d images like this and it we were able to add a bones and skeleton to it to it to make it less frustrating for us um aside from aside from that um moving on we had the point collection along with the ui and for that i will pass that on to my other fellow programmer gray So along with the UI, I was also in charge of the uh, point collection. And very early on, we decided as a group to have kind of like a um, kind of like a bullseye uh, colliders. There's gonna there's an outer collider and an inner collider, which will uh, equal ten points if you hit the inner collider. Um, depending on how many you know points you get, you uh, you'll get a letter grade. Um, the only way uh, you can get an F is if you get zero points, which you'll, you know, you'll have to actually like try and miss everything. So, you know, if you succeed, you'll get an F for your effort, you know? Uh, and so if you, uh, what will be discussed on the next slide and Nick will go more into more detail about it is that if you hit the inner collider a certain amount of times, you'll get a, um, power up bar. So I will let him continue on with that now. Okay, as mentioned in the start, one of the things is that our client specified that this is a game that is meant not just for entertainment, but also for research purposes. And one of the things was uh, seeing how the game itself and the performance of the player, their heart rate would change if there was a power up, if there was a mechanic that would end up uh, changing or at least perceiving a change in the gameplay. And the idea for that was the titular rhythm power bar. Now, this would be a, a function where 
after hitting the dead center of the bullseye a certain number of times, you would charge up the bar. And eventually, once you've hit the maximum charge, for 45 seconds, about a minute maybe on some songs, depending on the length, you would end up getting two backup dancers that would join you with those backup dancers you know, accompanying the movements and letting the stage feel a little bit more alive, maybe also some neat visual effects. And uh, one of the key things about this, though, was that this was only supposed to be visual. We could have it be that there was a point multiplier or that the beat of the song changed. But instead, the idea was that it should only be visual. It should be as a, we nicknamed it a placebo power up, where it potentially will cause the player to change their behavior, but there will be nothing to actually change the game itself in order to skew any results in the change of the player, which is something that we thought was very interesting as a function and we believe would have had a big impact on things like heart rate and elevation and potentially even accuracy, which would have been an interesting phenomenon. Now, moving on to the uh, next part, we have Brian, our uh, programmer. Well, well no. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Our PM. Nine weeks, he still can't get away. <laughs> Hello, I am Brian Eckelman. I am project coordinator for this wonderful team. I want to talk a little bit about uh, our partnerships and how that has really been my role and the way I've been able to most leverage my existing skill set to support Rhythm Power. Um, game design is not my field. It has never been my field. Advocacy is more my field. Um, but I found ways to really contribute all the same. And through our combined work, we, I think we made something that we can all say was a true success. Um, so in terms of the outside support, pretty early on in the project, I thought we should try to get a medical stakeholder opinion that might, and that, that might be helpful in both making sure that our move set was safe and like doable by our older population, target audience, but also make sure that it would meet the project goal of maintaining their heart rate. And in fact, when we did get an, we got in touch with a nurse from the PT department, Elena, and she gave really useful feedback that our move set was great, but we needed to remove the pauses between player moves. Initially, we had had the game set up as an almost Simon Says type format, where the move would be shown and then the player would follow it up. We switched that over to a synchronous format, more like in the vein of Dance Dance Revolution, in order to maintain the increased heart rate over the, peri the 10 minute period of time that we're aiming for. And that was really useful and important feedback. Uh, in addition, we have ran in through two, several technical issues and I was able to quickly contact and get connected with the folks up in the IT department in uh, the library here. And they were extraordinarily responsive and helpful. So in general, community partners have been enormous, enormous asset for us. I want to thank the, the entire team. It's been a pleasure and a privilege working with all of you. Um, we really had excellent synergy with each other from the very beginning. And we were able to have a big picture gameplay loop planned, vision planned before the end of the first day. And that was enormously helpful, but also like, impressive. We hit the ground running and kudos to us for that. Um, and I think we can we successfully made something that we can all not just have on our CV, but truly say we, we succeeded. We can be proud of this. Well done, everybody. I also want to give a special thanks to the staff here in the internship who have done so, so much to support us going above and beyond. Firstly, to you, Shirley, for guiding us through the development process, connecting us with useful resources along the way, and supporting us every step of the way when we got stuck. Also to Leanne, our client, for giving us really useful directive feedback towards which project goals which would be most highest priority and also most actionable at a given point, and also connecting us to amazing outside partners and giving us really great professional advice. Thank you, Leanne. And last but not least, to Ara, whose decisive yet compassionate leadership has taught us all so much about how to effectively inspire other people. I think I speak for everybody when I say that working under you has, I've, I've learned more than I thought possible about how to be the best kind of leader I can be, and anyone can be. There's truly no one else I would have rather had leading the ship. To all of you, without your success and support, none of this would have been possible. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We hope you enjoy grooving out to Rhythm Power. Um, and I will now turn over the floor to questions.
Oh, contact there. Thank you. <laughs>I would say it absolutely streamlined and I'm going to turn it. Uh, can you oh, repeat the question? The question. <laughs> so the question was, did having our game big picture vision complete before the end of the first day, make things e harder, easier, put us ahead, make it more complicated? And the answer I will give very briefly is it definitely helped and made things less complicated, but I'm going to turn it over to Nick, one of our designers to further elaborate on that. Yeah, like that's a great question. Honestly, the fact that we had a very good idea of what we wanted to do mechanically in terms of the game and how we wanted the gameplay loop to work within just the first day was invaluable because all of a sudden we knew, okay, we know what we want for the game. So what functions do we need for that? What assets are we going to need for that? I helped out, uh, as Abby mentioned, a lot more with designing the sort of uh, UI, the functions, a lot of the assets and helping plan out the concept of what are we going to need for this game in terms of that design. So helping out with that, it was invaluable to know what exactly we wanted to go for and almost having a checklist of all these things that we had to make, we had to implement, that we could get that done in the first week because we had a solid plan in the first day. Pretty much by the second week, we already had everyone working on getting those assets into a certain very, very early version of the game. And it was so valuable to actually know what we wanted and how we wanted it made. The efforts of Megan with a grabbing samples also helped a ton with that because all of a sudden we had a co not just a comprehensive idea of the game but a comprehensive idea of the aesthetic and a lot of the environments and while concept art wasn't included for me personally a lot of fun was made in figuring out well we have all these options which ones of these things do we want to go with so uh yes Um, can I? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say that that's a question for the uh, project manager. Okay. Um, I would say, <laughs> so the question was, uh, in addition to the technical and, I don't know, work-related cha um, pro project challenges, what were the team challenges that may have been difficult or required us to really work through in order to make the best game that we could? And I have to say, I want to give everyone a ton of credit. There weren't many. We were really synergistic. One of, I would say for me personally, the single largest challenge and probably also my largest takeaway is that it's okay not to always have something to manage and to step back because you guys, when I stepped back, really stepped up and in fact did better than I could have by trying to manage every aspect of this project. I, I mean, when I, when I stepped back, not stepped back and not wasn't there, but let you do your own thing, that's when we were successful. I, I've always see, thought leadership, and Ari, again, speaking to your style, having been really learning by proximity, I thought it was more hands-on, more micromanagey, for lack of a better way to put it, but it's not. Certainly not with a team like this. And I would say for me, realizing that was huge. Changing the way we did presentations initially, letting everyone speak to their own area, um, 
better being better prepared in that way and uh, having a sense of how we need to structure those. That was another huge thing. But I would say these are less interpersonal issues or challenges than just things we needed to learn each other's style. And when we learned each other's style, it was really smooth sailing. Any other questions? We have 17 seconds. <laughs> Okay. okay. Actually, I might cool. be uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I'll uh, we'll go ahead and go ahead and sit back down, and I'm going to take a moment to switch our um, presentations. But while we're doing that, I would also like to uh, ask Shavan to come up, and along with the team, to um get ready okay i'm sure okay there's also just a couple other things i need to do let me try to get that <laughs> one second let's see job do i know what i'm doing okay <laughs> Okay. Just <laughs> okay, and I need to fix some other things. So one sec. All right here. Okay, I think that's good. Oh, yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Shravan, and I'm the coach for the third team. Uh, we're Shogasle. Uh, the last eight weeks have flown by pretty quickly, and it's been really great to see this team uh, come together to create and develop these ideas we've had. Um, they've not only fit into their individual roles very well, but they've also won different hats uh, to contribute to the project as a whole. So um, I'm really excited to show you guys a project and I'd like to introduce Grace to kick us off. Hello, I'm Grace McIntyre. I'm the project manager and I'm going to uh, take you through a majority of the presentation before turning it off to the rest of my team. Before we get into our app, I would like to set the stage with some statistics. So 3.3 million people or 11.3% of the US population have diabetes. 1.45 million Americans are living with type 1 diabetes, which accounts for about 3.75% of all diagnosed cases of diabetes. Now, this may not seem like a lot, but remember, redheads only make up about 2 to 6% of the USA's population, and we're not exactly viewed as a rare sight in the US. According to the CDC, medical costs and work, lost work and wages for people diagnosed with diabetes total to about 327 billion yearly. Over the past few years, it has been noted that more than one third of diabetes related deaths have occurred in people under the age of 60. And if we narrow our age range even further, we can see that adolescents in particular have a high risk. In fact, I have a quote here that I'd like to share. This quote is from Transition and Diabetes, Young People Move On, We Should Too, about the dangers of diabetes in youth, since young people have higher rates of diabetes, diabetic emergencies, and death rates are significantly higher than in young people without diabetes. This is clearly a big problem, and so we have to come up with some solutions to fix this. There is no fix all to these problems, but there are certainly ways to help decrease the risk of additional sickness, injury, and death. And that's where our app Sugar Slay comes in. Sugar Slay is a health app, pet simulator with fun mini games, customizations, and more. By connecting to Dexcom sensors, which are small discrete sensors just beneath the skin that send glucose readings every five minutes and wearable technologies like a smartwatch or aura rings, the app receives a flurry of data, including but not limited to heart rate, sleep score, exercise, activity, and glucose levels. All of this connects to an in-game pet that you can take care of as users build, build healthy habits for diabetes management. The pet can be customized with items and skins purchased with coins by playing our mini games, many of which have informational component as well to educate users about diabetes and general health. 
Our focus for this app is to maximize long-term usage without mo monopolizing users' attention on a daily basis. This app is not designed to be a lifelong companion, but a tool for newly diagnosed teens to help build healthy habits, awareness, and knowledge around their condition that can effectively maintain that they can effectively maintain without the app in the future. I now like to show you a short preview of our game. There we go. There we go. So now that you've seen some clips of our app, we'd like to tell you a bit about the development and design of it. On the slide, you can see an early stage drawing of a home screen and what our final product look like, looks like. And you can see that while we did make a lot of quality changes, our original ideas were maintained throughout the project. We were tasked with creating an interactive app-based game that incorporates elements of essential health factors for effective diabetes man management. What we came up with was an iOS app that included these following elements a pet simulator, or as we called it, the Tamagotchi style, and hero's journey elements, which was something that the client was very persistent about having. We created three playable mini games, but the idea is to have many games with a variety of educational and non-educational dispersed throughout. Our intended age group is 13 to 19 year olds with a focus on type one diabetes. And finally, there is no mandatory game interaction. What we mean by this is originally we devised a flow that started with getting an alert that your blood sugar was either spiking low or high. What you see is a storyboard created by Johnny earlier on in the process for this type of flow. It would prompt you to inject insulin and then it would take you through a game or two that occupied the user's time while their levels evened out. However, there were a few problems with this. The flow was too long and it doesn't account for users' attention spans, especially teenagers or people's average day-to-day -day schedule schedules. It pushes the users to play games immediately which could turn many users away from an app like this. Instead, we ended up with a flow more like this. The user receives an alert and is prompted to use their insulin and then, and then is given the option to record a few words about how they're feeling or set an alarm to check back in 10 minutes or so. This is much shorter than our earlier outlines and accommodates for how our daily lives are busy. In addition, by having the user type how they're feeling, it encourages users to check in with their bodies, reactions, and make use of the predictive technology, which over time could anticipate users' physical states depending on certain situations. Predictive technology is already being used in many health apps, such as period trackers or readiness scores for athletes. Instead of the games being involved as part of the blood sugar flow spike, the mini games were shifted to be accessed via a game library. The three games we made and programmed are Medicinal Memory, Word Search, and Sugar Snake. Medicinal Memory is a pattern matching game derived from the popular Simon game. The icons of the game, instead of colors, are ingredients from a recipe that you unlock after the game. These recipes are diabetes friendly and are stored in a gallery in the app for further use. We, what we used here was a recipe for chicken salad, and we have worked on a list of future recipes that encompass a wide range of dietary needs and cultures. Our word search game contains one word related to diabetes in some way, in addition to whatever theme the rest of the game has. In this example, you can see diabulimia here. Diabulimia is an eating disorder that affects people with type 1 diabetes. It is when someone reduces or stops taking their insulin to lose weight. This is something that is clearly very dangerous, and hopefully by increasing awareness about it in teens, about what this is and why it's bad, we could prevent more people from developing this eating disorder. And finally, Sugar Snake, which is purely for fun and utilizes food art assets created for medicinal memory and follows the style of the classic snake game. To incentivize players to play the games, you will earn points at the end of the game, which translate to in-game coins. With these coins, you can purchase customizations for your pet, customizations that you can see here, all created by our artist, Molly. Art was actually one of our main hurdles that we overcame during this project. As you might've noticed, our group has the most people out of the three, including Johnny up here. We originally had a different artist, but halfway through the internship, they had to leave, and Molly was gracious enough to agree to join our team in addition to her original group. The switch in artistic direction led to changes within the game itself, which was daunting halfway through the project and started to feel like we were starting with 
ground zero at art halfway through. But we came out of that better than we could have dreamed with amazing artwork and aesthetics for the whole app. And I'd now like to pivot to welcome Johnny up to speak. Hello, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, hello, my name is Johnny. I use he, him pronouns, and I was one of the programmers for Sugar Slay. I'm very sorry that I couldn't be there in person today as I'm currently in San Francisco, but I'm very happy to still be able to participate remotely. Um, my contributions to the project in the early stages consisted mainly of concept work and planning out different game flows, as well as making the storyboards for them, one of which you saw earlier in the presentation. As the direction for our game became more clear, my later contributions were the word search mini game and making some sound effects and music for both the word search game and some other areas of the app. This internship was my first major experience with Unity and this didn't come without trouble. I faced a lot of technical problems and coding issues as I worked on the word search game, but I was able to overcome these through a mix of alternate routes and perseverance. Making the word search game taught me some important skills in Unity and C Sharp scripting, but it also taught me skills in communication with other team members, as well as planning my tasks and understanding my workflow. Overall, this internship was a great introduction to game design, and I plan on using the things I learned here in my future, whether I end up continuing to explore game design or not. Thank you, and I'll hand it off to Ben to keep the presentation going. Uh, okay. okay, sorry. Um, hi, my name is uh, Benjamin Rush. I use he and pronouns, and I am uh, one of the uh, three programmers for uh, Sugar Slay. Uh, my main contributions uh, was like uh, the uh, management of the GitHub repository and um, the coding behind um, uh, medicinal memory and the uh, sugars and the sugar snake games. Um, this uh, internship gave me a chance to apply the hard and soft skills that I had learned um, in, in my, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> in, um, my, in the uh, college classes I took as a game design, ma ma as a game design major up in uh, Champlain College to a uh, real world setting. Um, this greatly helped when um, communicating with teammates and navigating um, technical obstacles, including conflicts within the repository and implementing iOS functionality. Um, um, this also, uh, it also helped with, um, uh, with uh, coordinating with the uh, two other programmers in our team to ensure all the code was implemented smoothly and without bugs. Um, this internship also gave me a chance to participate in real-time hands-on communication with a client uh, that was directing our development and vision for our product, uh, an opportunity which I had not gotten yet during my uh, college my college courses. And I am going to pass this off to Luca. That's how you pass things on, folks. Anyways, good afternoon. My name is Luca. I use he, him pronouns, and I was the designer for the Sugar Slay team. So, oh, oh no. Oh no, did we go too far? There we go. Okay. As I was saying, um, my contributions were mainly designing sketches for the multiple frames for our memory game. I also came up with some of the storyboard ideas for two other mini games. The first one was, was done by Johnny, but I kind of filled in for him after he took on more of the programming responsibilities. And, I, and towards the end, I also thought and cataloged some ideas that could later be implemented into the final product even though our team didn't directly work, work on them. Now, a lot of the most useful skills that I learned were mostly all about collaboration, making sure that everyone had a voice and that, and that um, I was accepting of, of any other ideas that my team members had. And I also learned a lot of good skills in time management and breaking down large tasks into small chunks. And the main hurdles I faced were feeling a lack of creative freedom at times and also occasionally not knowing what I could do to be productive. But I think, oh, but I think at the end of the day, I think 
I think it all paid off and I think we were able to make something that we could all be truly proud of. And overall, while I don't see myself entering the field of game design as a career, I never would have realized that had I not applied for the censorship, which is why I am ultimately grateful for the experience and also just generally grateful to have met such amazing people along the way. And now I'm going to pass it on to a familiar face. No, 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 I'm Carl Kahl, an international student from the Philippines who will be studying in seven different countries for my bachelor's in AI and neuroscience. I am one of the game developers of Sugar Slate with a focus on research and UI UX. I designed the screens on Figma and then coded them on Unity. I consulted hundreds of screens from what you can see over there to know the why behind every element in the game from meticulously positioning the large glucose monitor to the place where our eyes typically rest when we are looking at our iPhones to the more boring buttons that ensured a seamless user flow. Coming to the internship though, I feared that I couldn't bring my best because I, like a lot of us, am rec recovering from burnout. I did not know any Unity, but that was a good thing. My brain actually enjoyed learning a new skill and when I thought I utilized everything Figma had to offer, I finally learned to put consistency is key into practice. So if you look at the screens there, I started designing reusable components, developed a design library, and was consistently using auto layout for responsiveness. Now, I'm pinching myself. This isn't the designer Carl I knew. This saved me hours of development in Unity. Instead of manually reapplying the same color style to every button I make, I was simply copy pasting content in. So to my developer friends in the audience, I hope this reminds us to keep our code dry. As in D-R-Y, don't repeat yourself. Now I'm handing off the mic to Molly before it rains again. In fact, it's raining, I'm seeing umbrellas outside and we all can't keep ourselves dry. Okay, so yeah, nice to meet you again. I'm Molly, I'm also an artist for this team as well. I was more of a later addition, but I think I got pretty used to it for my part of the project. I mainly worked on, again, art assets, but this time more 2D art assets since this was a mobile game. And when I worked on this, we wanted to keep to a certain companion animal, like this creature that we have. If you've probably already seen plenty of the concept art of it, but when I was doing this, I was using more 2D programs, which I'm not as used to. I do have a background in 2D art, but this was more of an experience for me because I got to use more of these programs, which were like Krita, Photoshop, and Ace Sprite. Ace Sprite was more specifically a pixel program. The other ones are regular 2D programs. And other details that I got to apply to this, I guess in being a new addition, I was using my ability for being adaptable and just adding detail and making sure that we were organizing our style and making sure we were applying it correctly. And one of our other obstacles in general was the onboarding process. But I feel like, and by sheer coincidence, I also was diagnosed with T1D. I was part of the, I was, and part, I was technically part of the target audience. So when I was doing this and the art for Sugar Slay, I was trying to keep in mind what would have appealed to me when I was in high school, when I was diagnosed. I'm 21 now, but I was diagnosed in high school. So I kind of acted as like our mediary, just trying to make sure our information was correct and just kind of corroborating on that and just making sure the feel for this was right for our target audience and just making sure that we weren't overstepping or just adding incorrect information in general. 
and I'm going to hand it off to Grace again. Uh, hi, it's me again. I was the project manager for the team, and I'd like to share what I think some of my most valuable contributions were. I covered all bases that dealt with organization, planning, presentations like this one, and communication along with providing feedback and direction for each role. I did work as scrum manager where I was able to learn how to use JIRA for the first time, and I was involved game design element that included storyboarding, UI designing with Figma, and accessibility concerns. I also contributed to art throughout the project, including basic um, planning of the art direction, and then creating digital art where I created the mini game icons within the app, as you can see here. Um, this internship has taught me a mixture of hard and soft skills. I'm someone who plays very little video games and I don't interact with design a lot. So this was all very new to me. I gained many skills not specific to a program like how game design works overall from the process to the nitty gritty details such as what is UI, which is something I didn't know before this. My position allowed me to refine a lot of skills that I previously gained as a theater director and a restorative justice practitioner. However, I hadn't used these skills in a structured office setting before. I. I'm used to leaning into leadership positions and I feel like I sometimes fall into that leader like role, but that's something that I've always had to balance with my autism and ADHD since social interactions can be especially draining for me. And I feel like this internship gave me the opportunity to balance all of that and learn how to do that in an office setting like this with not as much higher stakes as a job outside in the workforce. I'd like to thank all of you for attending and listening to our presentation and thank everyone uh, in this team and our coaches and staff here. Um, thank you for learning about Sugar Splay and we hope you to see you at our play test se session. And we'd like to open the floor for any uh, a question, comment or feedback. And, um, but we all, oh, yes. For Johnny specifically, what's your avatar full of today? <laughs> <laughs> Putting you on the spot. Sorry, uh, Grace, could you repeat that into the mic for me? What is your avatar full of today? <laughs> and would you like to explain that? Um, so every day at the office, I would draw our little, uh, the little mascot for our game on the whiteboard. And I would write that it was full of something else. It's just like a fun way to kind of bring some uniqueness to every day. Um, currently, I am full of some very harsh lighting from my window next to me. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and thank you all for. Uh, oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, there was a question online asking, "What is GitHub?" For anyone that would like to explain. Okay. <laughs> great. Then, uh, so, come up okay. here. The question was, "What is GitHub?" So okay, uh, great. Now I gotta explain what GitHub is. Um, <laughs> so like, uh, GitHub is like uh, the official term for it is like a version control software. But like, basically, it's like um, it's kind of a way to like uh, allow like everyone to like um, Work on work on a project without it like creating without it like conflicting or overriding like another person's work. Um, so like uh, how it basically work is that you can make like like these like kind of like branches which are kind of like basically like uh, like separate versions of the project that like separate copies of the project that like someone can do their own work in and like. Uh, that way, in case there are any bugs or anything that like uh, those bugs didn't wouldn't move on to the. Um, to like the main version to the main version of the project which is like you know like the final version of the project sometimes like sometimes it just shows up on the main build anyway so like it at the end like it almost didn't really matter but like um but uh like it's just kind of a way to help like you know keep things separate and uh when it would come time to actually um, um like uh, put those features onto the main build of project uh, uh the uh, we would like merge the branches to the uh, main. So that in essence is kind of what GitHub is, I think. Yeah.
<laughs> we have seen you, Johnny. Hi. Go ahead and um, turn your video off for a super quick, Johnny. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Johnny, the way. Okay. I get the spotlight. <laughs> we love that you love the spotlight. <laughs> oh, it's loading. There we go. Thank you very much. Okay, and so um, at, at this point we are wrapping up and I'd like to first of all say, wasn't that fantastic? I mean, come on, right? Another hand, round of applause for these teams. Um, they were amazing. Um, and I'd also like to say that in addition to uh, the National Science Foundation, which has uh, contributed substantially to this, we have had an anonymous donor who has made a donation um, and extremely, uh, we're grateful for this anonymous gift that's kickstarted the Bouvet Neurodivergent Workforce Development Fund. Um, this fund allows us to continue the programming that you saw here today and offer additional opportunities to job seeking interns about, actually most three quarters of our interns are headed back to college. And so this is sort of like helping them get ready for when they are in the workforce. Um, looking for that first job, but a couple of our people are ready. They're out there, they're looking for jobs right now. And so um, this fund allows us to extend a couple extra opportunities to them. Um, we would appreciate uh, any attention that you can bring to this yourselves, sharing through your network. So please um, feel free to take a, a photo of that a QR code so you can uh, get the website. It will take you directly to a Bouvet link if you have someone that you want to share it with or if you want to um, donate to it yourself. Um, we also have many people to thank all of their icons are up here. Okay, so here we go. Of course, we're gonna start with the National Science Foundation for supporting this program uh, since 2019. And this year we were awarded a supplement to the program to extend our work to look at uh, remote work opportunities. As, as we all know, since the pandemic, a lot of the world has gone remote. That is very different. You saw how well our interns work together. They actually really didn't like it when we told them that every Wednesday they were supposed to work from home. <laughs> but, but it was something that is actually good to get used to, get used to what kind of work works well from home, what kind of work works well when you're together, and it's work that we, we um, are examining in our research. We want a major thanks to Pierre, who you heard earlier today, for supporting um, our partnership with Ubisoft for the past three years. Pierre and his team have provided us with some real valuable real world context for our interns, for our program to know that we're not joking, that your skills and talents are really desired in the workforce, in the game development design workforce, um, and that they have been providing that leadership uh, training for us, and they've also provided mentors, mentors who are currently working in Ubisoft that identify as neurodivergent or who um, have family members who are neurodivergent. And these folks include um, Brian Bartram, Chloe Patricia Hodgson, um, Megan Hobby, and they helped participated in a QA session that we had for our interns last week. And then Marilyn Brian will be hosting a workshop tomorrow that is on specifically getting started in the games industry. And so that's what we have two more days for our interns to sort of wrap things up. We'd also like to thank um, Aspire at MGH and especially Jack Lewis at Aspire. Yeah, okay, we got a couple of people who are fans of Jack. Uh, <laughs> um, I know that Jack is online uh, joining us today. Um, he recommended to us a number of really talented interns to our program, and he's been providing guidance to our group on issues of neurodiversity in the workforce. He gave a lunch and learn workshop on this. Um, and also he connected us with a teen group that's part of Aspire. So we had younger teens come and actually get to see and play test the games and get inspired to be part of this in the future, right? That there's actually role, roles for you, stick with games, that's, there's, a, there's a future there. Okay, I told you that this started in San Diego um, many years ago. And, but we moved here to Northeastern two years ago and Ara came with me. You've heard lots of great things about Ara. We're thrilled to have her here. And we were really excited to come to Northeastern because they are renowned for co-op opportunities and experiential learning. So what a great partner we thought that would be. 
but wow, <laughs> were they ever. <laughs> so we are super grateful for the time and talent from our Northeastern colleagues. And I'd specifically like to thank Dean Gregory Abowd and co-op faculty who are here, Max Sater and Eric Brenner from the College of Engineering. Yeah, all right. <laughs> For reviewing the intern's work, uh, Dean Abowd can't be here today, but he actually came specifically to review the intern's work and give them some feedback because he knew he couldn't be here today. He's a big proponent of this work. And we had a lunch and learn from, from Max um, for the second year going, telling us about uh, everything from resume building, networking, and, and both Eric and um, Max offering to see our interns are for one-on-one -on -one informational interviews and be resources going forward. We'd also like to thank Bouvet faculty, Winston Kennedy, who's in the back over there, and uh, who, as someone who's called out Elena Manolas, uh, for volunteering their time to provide feedback to projects. Winston came along and did the same thing that Dean Abowd did, and uh, came in and met and gave feedback. And uh, Winston's work is about exercise in families, uh, kids, kids with autism, particularly black kids with autism. We look forward to making games that will be useful for Winston's work in the future. So um, we also want to give special thanks to Anna Schwartz, a postdoctoral fellow who is, is still here and was a client for the peer play group, the first group you heard, and for Sundar um, Ringarjan, who is also there, yes, who was a, a client with me um, when, before he left for India and then I took over uh, for the Sugar Slay project. I'd also like to thank, uh, and those, those are all from the Bouvet College of Health. I'd like to thank uh, Louis Gaetan from the Game Design Studio and Johnny Auk from the Immersive Media Lab at the College of Art, Media and Design for providing the opportunity for our interns to come and experience immersive virtual reality. So they went and they had this great experience in the lab uh, during one of their lunch and learns. Okay, finally, I'm the last thing standing between you and eating and game playing, <laughs> recognizing that. I want to give a big shout out, you've heard this before, to Ara Jung. Okay. Not, yes, not only here, right? You've heard on how central she's been as a guide, as a leader, a side-by-side -side leader with our interns and shown them what, what workplace could be, that it's fun and it's exciting and it's kind and supportive. Um, but she also navigated a ridiculous number of bureaucracies. If you can imagine getting people paid, not just here, but also at UC San Diego, when they're not employees, nor are they students, but she figured it out and made sure that checks actually arrived somewhere close to on time. Um, so she's been doing this for a while. She also helped support our sister program um, at UC San Diego once we moved here, which is a big deal because they're now all on their own. So again, big shout out. To Ara, thank you so much for all you do. Um, I want to ask for a little bit of patience from the families here as we want one big group picture for, uh, before everyone takes off of all the interns. If you can all stand up here in front of our, our sponsors, we're gonna do that quickly. And then we're gonna ask that um, the, the, I think lunch, lunch, is, lunch is here and ready, right? Um, <laughs> We want to make sure our interns get to eat because they're going to be they're going to be showing you things. So if you if you let them grab some food, we'd appreciate that. Okay, Johnny, can you turn your camera on? Am I on the big screen? <laughs> I'm going to do two more. One, two, three. Johnny, you said you liked the. Uh, <laughs> 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 one, two, three. Okay, all right. We're going to have the coaches come in too. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 All right, give the father, your camera to the father, my father behind you, you can take it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three. All right, one, two, three. <laughs> okay, thank you. Monique is the person who makes things go. Oh, really loud. <laughs> 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 All right, so.
Awesome. Okay. So, what did you guys go first to get food? Yeah. And then everyone that's going to be in the back of the room, there's three spaces that I'm Okay. All right, so, yep, thank you again for taking the time to come in. I want to also thank people that were here remote, and thank you for your support, and uh, we're going to go ahead. And, yep. All right, cool, and thank you so much again for coming. Cool.